As Tony said, my name's John, I'm from SVI in Melbourne. Used to be part of uh, Melbourne Uni until three weeks ago. We had a bit of a acrimonious split, but uh, we're happy now, we're all best of friends. <laughs> Ideas up there. Um, if you're wondering in the talk who I might sound like with my wonderful English accent, and you have young kids, it will be this guy. <laughs> it's uh, Mr. Maker, if you don't have young kids, pay no attention. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, why open source? Uh, you know, why do we care? What's the big deal? Is it because we think of the philosophy and we think that, like our friend Richard Stallman here, proprietary software is injustice, it's call to arms, you know, property is theft. No, we're using Macs, we're putting Microsoft Office on, etc. We're not open source zealots. We might like it, but it's not the main reason. Is it because open source is free? <coughs> Probably not. I'm sure if we'd ask our friends at Casper, they'd say that the uh, TCO of Casper is actually probably lower than an open source solution, potentially. Um, you know, we get paid quite a bit of money for doing our jobs. We don't work for free. So, and if we can have a paid for solution that's even better, maybe that's the way to go. Is it because we love the code? Is it because we want to edit and do it all? Um, no, not really for me. Uh, I'm not too keen on getting my hands dirty. I'd probably say the biggest and the best thing about uh, the Mac open source community and the sysadmin community in general, so it is, is the sysadmin community. It's really cool. You can be part of it. Um, I, I gave a talk four years ago, and I wanted to ask Greg Neagle from Disney, who created Monkey, some questions, and I just sent him an email. He told me um, some great tips and tricks. He sent me his presentations. And you'll see time and time again that um, if you look at the, the repos behind a lot of the products you're seeing today, you see the same names. And so if you come up with an idea, you can shoot it off somebody else. If you've got uh, suggestions, you talk right to the person who did it. So what are the advantages of free or open source? Just do it. If you like anything you see today, you can download it right now on your laptop during a session. Probably prefer you wait to the end, but you can do it. Just try it out. There's no license required. Might be easier, might not. Um, we have a lot of on-demand servers. Uh, provided us from ITS, we can just use them. So actually, there's almost no cost involved to putting up a lot of these services. Even as a trial, we don't have to get me involved. We can just, just do it. No salesman will call. Now, I actually was in a meeting with Justin three weeks ago, and it was a very pleasant meeting with Casper. They're lovely. Uh, but for me, one of the things I hate is the terror of uh, trying to download something from the internet, and you go to the form, and you put in your details, you you might have to make an account, and then you hit the submit button, and then there's, are you going to get a download link, or is it you're just going to show your message, thanks for your interest, somebody will contact you. Can't stand it. All of these, just do it. And there's excellent community to support. You can, there are lots of mailing lists for all of the technologies. You can email people. There are even a few commercial companies supporting it. Um, really, the community is excellent. So what do we want out of our open source management tools? Number one, no Mac servers. That just gives me the heebie-jeebies. When we were talking earlier this morning about X serves and who hasn't, uh, not only am I glad that they're dead, I wish they never existed in the first place. Apart from the shiny, shiny box, awful, awful devices. I'm sure they ran some nice stuff, but it's my opinion anyway. We want it to be open source, or, prefer or at least free. There's one notable package we'll look at today that's free rather than open, support, uh, open source, and it, it makes its own way. We'll talk about that in a moment. We want things to be modular. We want them to be reusable. We don't want to bake things in that we can't reuse. Uh, and I said it's an excellent community, but we really want an active community. Let's not go and pick an open source product that some guy's created to tickle his fancy, and, and you can't get any support of it. We have to make sure that we pick a, an open source technology that's progressing that's, that's going on, so we make sure. And the number one thing I want, I want it to run from a web server, because web servers are a known quantity, they're nice and secure, we've got SSL, and we can scale them very easily. It's not hard. So I guess I should have called the talk, 
modern, free, open source, if possible, preferable. We're not running on a Mac modular component. It's active community running from a web server, Mac management. It's not quite as uh, <laughs> catchy, I'm afraid. <coughs> okay. So if we start at how we get our Mac sorted for people, we go, move straight on to deployment. Well, we, we've been pick, talking quite a bit about DEP, DEP, zero touch. Um, for us, we kind of like to give our computers as a finished product to our end users. So DEP might help our support staff, but it's probably not going to be a way that we deploy anything um, yet. Fin imaging, the idea is that you use the image that comes with the device from Apple. Um, not overly keen on that. Um, I, I use our powers at B don't really like iWork, and that comes with a lot of Macs, and we have to remove it because otherwise people make documents in iWork that they can't share. It's our experience. You know, some people love iWork. That's fine. So in the end, we end up making a lot of custom images. One of the most popular ways of deploying a custom image for us has become a little SSD, USB free drive. It's got Mac OS X on here. Plug it in in the field, boot it, and then carbon copy cloner straight onto it. Really handy way, especially if you don't have netboot going out through your, your subnets. But probably the way we're going to do most of our deployment is over the network. What do we want in an image? Well, we want to have bootstrapping and deployment tools. How are we going to get our packages on? We want to do our settings, maybe our power settings, our VPN, et cetera, et cetera. Basic applications, well, everybody's going to need Office. They might need EndNote. Let's put that on there. We'll put our admin accounts. If we're small enough, we might put printers. If we're big enough, we might not. Maybe we'll put more applications. We're doing an image for a whole little section of our, our institute. They all need SPSS. Well, let's put that in the image. Isn't that great? And finally, let's put our operating system updates. Makes sense. Or does it? This is a so-called fat image. Let's, and it's not very desirable. So let's, sorry, I'll get rid of that picture. It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so what do we really want in our image? Well, bootstrapping and deployment tools, OS 10 updates. So let's get everything out. Even the updates, you might say it's optional. Firstly, I'd say up updates are the only thing we want in the image. Let's not even put our bootstrapping deployment tools. Let's move that further down the process. Um, updates, might as well. So this has become, it makes a very modular deployment. We're decoupling settings from the imaging process. We're going to use packages rather than baking things into the images. And that way, you know, I'll give you an example of an admin account. You know, let's say we put an admin account in an image. Well, we probably want to change our admin account once a month, once a quarter, once a year, whatever it is. So we're going to have to make a package to do that anyway. So let's not put it in there. Let's just do it the once. We'll install applications later. So how do we make an image in the first place? You might be familiar with auto DMG, or as it's affectionately known, auto damage. Um, made by Per Olsen in University of Gothenburg. Uh, it's a really handy little tool. What you can do is go to the Mac App Store, download the latest version of OS X. Um, it sits in your applications folder. Apple seem to be pretty good about sending out the very latest version all the time. So, for example, when the new clicky trackpad Macs came in, like the very next day, you could download this image, which was required for it. Um, it is going. I think I left a bit too long. So we simply drop it on. It also DMG examines it, finds out what the updates are. These are curated updates. So they're not, it doesn't really search. It searches a plist back on the auto GMG site. So it only gets updates that are suitable to be put in an image. You see down the bottom, you can actually put additional software. Well, we're not going to do that because, as we said, we want to do it a bit later on. And what this does is it creates a, a DMG file, and it installs the OS X into the DMG file. So it's never been booted. It's never touched any Mac hardware. It's never even started. And it just creates us a nice little disk image that's completely fresh. Uh, and it will also um, do the whole ASR restore, so it's immediately ready for um, booting. Um, it's hard to get the timing right. <laughs> yeah, so it's going to put on all that. Lovely. Cool. That's the image. Probably a bit long. All right. OK, great. so it's made us lovely fresh image that we'll be able to restore using any of our deployment techniques. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're using uh, the Jamf deployment server, uh, Deploy Studio, things like that. 
you can use it or, or straight away for your uh, Thunderbolt hard drive. Actually, a lot of people are using their uh, IMAX and deploying it that way. Um, the last one, multiple payload, payload variations can be managed. is actually straight from um, the talk that Per Olsen gave on it. I, said, I don't agree with that. I mean, you might consider, as I said, making different images for different groups, but I say keep them lean. Less is definitely more. So how do we get out? Um, Deploy Studio, I imagine a lot of people are using it. I don't really want to spend much time uh, on Deploy Studio, simply because the big problem with it is not so much that it's donation or ad-supported. It's OS X only. It has to run on a, on a Mac server. Uh, and really, for a lot of people, that might be the last Mac server you have is for Deploy Studio. Uh, so instead, we've got a much nicer, newer system, Imager. It's uh, fairly recent created by Graham Gilbert, um, no longer of Pebble IT, he's now moved on, I'm sure where. Uh, it fits all of our, our, ticks all our boxes, Apache 2 license, Linux, it runs for web server. And we'll also use uh, BSD Pi. BSD is technology, is, is Apple's version of uh, Pixie Boot. It's the way that it sends out the messages and will boot the Mac, uh, made by, I wrote it down, Pepine, um, Varun from University of Michigan. And it's quite tricky to set up, so he's provided a very nice Docker uh, container for us. I believe they found that they had some slight scaling issues with it, with a huge amount of requests, and they've actually created a version now that integrates with Redis that handles tens of thousands of um, boot P requests every second. So for Imager, we create a P list where we put all of the settings. Uh, so here we have the actual download URL of the image that we're going to deploy. Now we're going to put in our monkey tools, which are our bootstrapping, our, our deployment tools, the config, and then we can just create a little file here. And this just tells monkey, run and run and run until you can't run anymore. This is a bit ugly. At the moment, you have to compile it. Uh, it it's only been out a couple of months, so perhaps that explains it. But as compiling goes, it's possibly the nicest compiling thing I've ever used. It just seems to work, um, because it's pretty simple. And it creates a, an MBI file, which you should be familiar with from various other imaging technologies. We can then upload this to our BSD Pi server. And this is just a folder where we've put all of the assets that we need for the deployment, start it up. And so the BSD Pi is running both a web server and a TFTP. You can separate them off depending on the scale you need. Uh, just get logs in now. Just to show you, we start up our shaky VM. Fusion actually does a clever thing. If you don't give it a hard drive to start off with, it will netboot, which is very handy for this demonstration. And so, yeah, as you can just see, it gets the TFTP. And now we go to speed it up time. <laughs> it's much faster in real life. It's just, uh... um, so Imager starts up. Here's a deployment password. This um, is not a real security thing. It's just to simply stop your um, end users wiping their own machines. You might not want them to. Uh, we can have multiple workflows. At the moment, we've just got the one image. So we'll just run it, and one of the things we said we want to do is put in a computer name. Um, you can just get it to pick the serial or the MAC address with the computer name if you want it to, but we like to give it its own name. Runs the workflow, does the restore. Again, if you look at the clock, it's not actual time. <laughs> the other things go. Uh, and then, great, so it's installed, all, all it's installed it and put a monkey, and now when we reboot our VM, as you can see, it goes straight to Manage Software Center. Um, that's only just like one small part you need to do a bit more, obviously, for your workflow to get rid of everything else. But that will now start installing packages, which is pretty cool. Uh, as I said, images vary pre release, um, but it seems to work very well. Uh, but it's under very active development, and there's a lot of people interested in it because, in general, people want to move away from Deploy Studio in the community. I'm not going to spend too much time on Monkey. I think most people know about it. It's basically a client server way of deploying things from Greg Neagle at Disney. Um, what I wanted to perhaps suggest is that you might have looked at Monkey a few years ago, and this is what you saw. Uh, lots of command line stuff. It's in, this is just importing Firefox into our Monkey repository. Uh, and it, it's not hard, but it's not particularly friendly. Uh, certainly not when you have all of the nice graphical sort of tools normally. And it's all a bit of a pain. And so. What Monkey is doing here is it just scans the, uh, the DMG, get, extracts the information, and then we tell it whereabouts it needs to go. It then creates this installation plist with all the information about it. And if you need to make any changes here, you can do. It's a simple copy of the application. Uh, and that's lovely. So, and then to deploy it to a Mac, we then 
get a, a, a manifest. Each Mac has a manifest, and so do the usual thing of copying one that already exists, renaming it, and so on. So it's all a bit manual, and if this put you off using Monkey, I'm not surprised, and so I mean, manage this all the time. Uh, get the idea. And so we'd add Firefox. So that was then. This is now. Monkey Admin came out. It's a desktop tool created by Hans Ujilitian. And it is the University of Ivaskula in Finland, where it's from. It is uh, a very handy tool. Basically, runs on your desktop. You point it at your Monkey repository. Scans all of your packages, all of your manifests, all your catalogs. We need a bit of a cleanup in our Monkey repository, the old versions, but uh, a little less. So it's much easier to import something. Just drag it, drop it on. The Monkey admin is just still, still calling the Monkey tools underneath. So it's still pretty simple. Creates a playlist. And then when we go and look at what we've just made, this is a nice, easy way. Instead of looking at that horrible playlist file, instead, there we go. It's a copy from DMG. It's in these catalogs. Let's put it in the application category. And we can do other things uh, with Monkey. And that's what it's actually going to do. This is what it requires. Maybe there's a minimum OS version. Maybe you've got a maximum. Uh, it's going to copy. If, you, if Firefox is running, it won't run. And then here is a, a typical post install script. Uh, and this is just for Firefox. What it's doing is setting the proxy um, in the, in the um, Mozilla preferences. Uh, sorry, not the, pro the proxy in the home page. How to uninstall it. So if you, so went, and then if we go to the, uh, so there are different catalogs, you can have testing, et cetera, et cetera. And then the manifests. This is a basic manifest that all of our Macs get. There's Firefox showing up in there. Maybe we want to make a new manifest that targets a particular application, a particular Mac. Again, it's all a lot nicer uh, doing this. We can simply say, um, make, so we just, we just add a package to it like so. But you can imagine if you've got a lot less technical people, this is a nice thing for them to use. So that's how we did it. Um, we can also nest the manifest and say, OK, well, this one, we'll, all in, we'll include the basic manifest as well. Um, should, should do that. Cool. So this is like the creation side and so on. Obviously, we need a management side. Monkey Web Admin is one of two packages. There's another one called Monkey Report PHP. It does a very similar thing. This one, again, created by Greg, who created uh, Monkey in the first place. And it's a Python web app that uh, the clients run a little post install script. And they say, before they run, um, send everything that's going on. After you've run, send it all again. And you can see this has gone wrong. This is a 10.6 machine. And we're getting warnings here that it couldn't install packages that were designed for 10.7. So uh, we can see what's going wrong. Um, it's very handy. And also, uh, Macs will report if they error during the installation process. This is a, a Mac that's um, it's checked Monkey, but it hasn't actually installed yet. So that's why these two packages here, the Firefox and the Netflix, uh, haven't actually installed. And we can do other clever stuff like try, straight away check status. Um, expired. Probably time to get a new one. And from here, we can look at the inventory of what's actually installed on an individual Mac. This shows all of the applications. Unfortunately, it has the standard disease of not really knowing what an application is. Um, and then we can go from it and go straight to the manifest that actually says that. So if you've got, if you want to split your monkey admin people, you can have uh, like the tech support who install the stuff just accessing the manifest through this. And people who are making packages using monkey admin. Uh, and then this is showing us every single package that we have installed across our entire fleet of Macs that use monkey. Um, so if we just look at Prism, for example, we can see that it's installed on these Macs. These are the versions that have it. So it's a pretty nifty um, way of seeing all of this. Okay. So now we've got our Mac installed. We've got all of the software we need on there. How do we keep it up to date? Well, the two ways. So auto package, um, going created by Per, per Olson. It's a set of Python scripts that will poll um, your GitHub repository, which has recipes of what you want to install. Uh, it's probably easier to see it and explain it. Um, it's a bit nasty if you do the command line way. So somebody has kindly made auto packager. This is by the Lind group in Emeryville, which I think is hiding with Pixar. And it is a GUI for auto packager. That's the way it is. 
So here is the official GitHub repository for AutoPackage. As you can see, there are lots of applications that you recognize and you'd want to install. And so you can simply, if we go into one here, um, look at Java, you see that there are three or four sometimes different recipes, and it's split into three components. How do we download an application? How do we know when a, a new version is there? So if we look at Oracle, for instance, this one tells us, go to this Oracle URL, run a little regex on it, find out what the latest version of Java is to download, and then it downloads it. And as you can see, there are hundreds of them, and they're all polling different web pages. Then how do we make it into a package? Well, Oracle have become a bit scumbaggy on the Mac, and they've now started wrapping the Ask toolbar around the latest version of Java. So what that did there is it opened up the package, extracted out the good, just clean Java package, and made a package of that and left behind the Ask toolbar. And then this one is how do we install it into Monkey, and so there's sort of various ways. And um, you know, if you saw Duncan talking, you thought, wow, that's a lot. You might, that does a lot of the hard work for you in packaging. Somebody who knows what they're doing has pre-done what's the best way of getting it installed. Um, so this is how we integrate it straight with Monkey. Uh, might have missed it there, but it also integrates with Jamf there. It goes straight with the, um, a, the Casper API, so you can get this to add packages there. Rather than just using the GitHub there, um, the main GitHub libraries, you can also use your own. And this is showing all the different, so this is just replicating the uh, packages, the recipes we saw earlier. We select the ones we want. We set a schedule of when we run it. So this just runs on my desktop. And I say run it every 24 hours. It runs, it checks all the recipes. If there's anything new to download, it downloads it. It then imports it straight into Monkey into the testing uh, catalog. And then it sends me an email saying, hey, you've got new software. So I can come in in the morning and I know straight away, great, I've got this new software. I'll check it out in the testing. When I'm ready, I'll move the catalog and put it into the production. Um, auto package is it's very good for updating software, but also it's very good for the first time you want to install something. So you know, if you say, well, I need to have Evernote, I haven't done an Evernote package, just go along and get it from here. It's not just for updates, it's for initial installs as well, um, like I just said. Um, rather than, if you, if you wanted to customize your auto package recipe, rather than cloning somebody else's and using the clone one, uh, and then doing, you, you, you can instead provide an override. And the advantage of doing that is if the mechanism of downloading a package or whatever changes, you'll lose that change because you've cloned it and you've got your own copy. Whereas with an override, what you do is you say, okay, I want to call the, the, the Java version of the package. And I, I, whatever comes out of that, then I will just apply this override. So you might want to add in there a, a post-flight script, for example. Um, you can have it integrate with a continuous integration server. This is um, how quite a few people do it. They uh, run a Jenkins CI server on their Macs. Um, I don't want to run a Mac server, nor do I want to run Jenkins CI, so we don't. Uh, but that, the advantage of that is you can just have a standalone server. It runs every night or however often, and the uh, Jenkins CI will email you to say, hey, you've got a new package. Certainly, if you've got a team of people, it might be something you consider doing. Next, how do we keep the Mac up to date? Well, repos to do also from Greg Neagle, and basically this is a set of Python scripts that will download Apple updates. Um, and there's a very nice front end to it called Margarita. Uh, if we look at it, this is the, um, we run a cron script that runs the, uh, the, the repo packages. And so what this is doing now is it will go along to the Apple update servers, mirror the catalog, download all of the packages, and uh, make them available. The advantage of repos to do is that you can have multiple branches of your updates. So you can just have the Apple branch, you can have testing, you can have a production. And so it allows you to actually test all of your Apple updates. Uh, we found that firmware updates were a bit tricky. Uh, and so we just didn't allow them through for a while until that got sorted out. So this is just going to do an overlong scan of everything. Um, okay. And so it, it's making an exact mirror of the Apple update. So this is Margarita, the front end to it. And this is just a way that we approve packages. So um, as you see, this is the production branch. These are the packages. If you're seeing them, it means that they're unlisted. When you list them, they go away. So we're going to say, OK, we're happy with iTunes. Let's push that to the production branch. Everybody then be able to download it and hit the apply, and then they'll go away. So you can just use this as a, a caching server as well um, so that 
Macs who don't even manage can use this for updates. Now, universities will tend to have unlimited bandwidth, and Apple updates are on, Acme, or, sorry, on Rnet anyway. But if you were a bit bandwidth um, constrained, you can set this server up and then just do a bit of DNS poisoning to point anybody to it. Um, and they'll all install fine because the packages are all signed by Apple, so Apple Update is very happy. So that's all about software. How do we actually manage the Mac? And as we know now, we've moved to configuration profiles. Largely, there are two sorts of configuration profiles. And I think this gentleman this morning said one of the reasons that they're still using open directory is because they couldn't use the MCX um, profiles. There's actually a way of doing that. So application-specific profiles. So this is um, exactly what we did from open uh, from uh, MCX. We get a P list and then we create it into, into, a, into a configuration profile. And then there's the operating system settings. Generally, the best way of getting the OS settings, if you're not using an MDM to make a profile, is actually just to use Apple server app, get profile manager, and then create the profile that you'd like, and then just download it. Um, but to create your application-specific configuration profiles, there's a great tool here from Tim Sutton. Already heard about him once today, Concordia University of Montreal. Um, MCX to profile. So let's say that you have a constant bug where everybody, you open up Word, it says, ah, check for updates. Your users aren't admins, so they can't check for updates, or you don't want them to. And so what you would have done previously is you just said it's manual. Now this changes a plist in your library, providing your application vendor does it this way. For example, the com.microsoft.autoupdate2 plist. And so that's in the local library. Um, if we open it up, these are the applications that are affected by it. And then at the bottom here it says how to check manual. So that's the setting that we want to push out to all of our, our Macs. So all we need to do is run MCX profile. Copy it over. Um, so we copy over the P list that we want to turn into a profile. We also need to give it an identifier. Now that is how the Mac refers to it. And if we want to remove it, that's the name we use. You can also do manage once, manage often here as well. It still exists. And then when we, when we want to open it, results vary a little bit. And if we open up the profile that it's made, you can have a look inside. And we can see that it is just a standard profile, like any other, with the settings that we want. And this is very handy for licensing. Uh, and for any other configuration that you want to do for your applications. How do we get our profiles out? Well, traditionally, MDM. Profiles and MDMs are sort of hand in hand. Uh, that's when you think of profiles, you're generally thinking of that. Um, and already mentioned it, Apple, um, Apple Profile Manager. Again, we've got problems. It's OS 10 only. It's on a Mac Mini. It's Apple licensed. It's not open source. It is cheap. Um, but it's rubbish. <laughs> you would not believe how long it takes to put an emoji into a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> My wife was like, why have you got a picture of a poo in Photoshop? I'm like, don't ask. <laughs> so so <laughs> anyway, there are much better ways of doing it. Self-service. You can actually put profiles just on the web, get people to download them. This is really handy if you've got um, Wi-Fi settings in um, in a profile or VPN, you can just stick them on your website, direct your users, say, go to this website, download this profile, double click it, hey, you've got Wi Fi settings. Other electronic distribution. It's quite an interesting one. I see this talk tomorrow. Um, iBeacons, technology nobody knows about. I had heard about it, and I thought of a great device that you could have in a meeting room. It's a Wi Fi device, iBeacon, you walk in there, it pushes out a profile with the Wi Fi settings, you then connect to the Wi Fi, you then leave the meeting room, the iBeacon removes the profile. Sounds phenomenally good. So that's one way you could do other profiles. Profiles themselves, that's all it is to install one. I, I think people forget that you can either double click or just run it. You can script it. Um, and it's pretty simple. So if you can script it, you can obviously package it. So we can put our profiles in a package and deploy them in our normal methods. Puppet. I think quite a few people thought I was going to talk a lot about Puppet. Um, I'm not. But it is one way of doing it. It's a Ruby way, typically used for managing Linux servers. And there's, there's quite a lot of um, work within the Mac community to get Puppet working well with Macs. Um, generally, MDMs are sort of kind of not in favor, and Puppet is a way of managing your Macs, ensuring that things are installed. Um, there have been numerous talks. 
if that's of interest to you, I'll let you look at it on your own. I kind of think that, um, uh, sorry, yeah, and then Monkey. Of course, we can install them with Monkey. You might say, well, you install packages with Monkey. Why is that extra? Um, well, Monkey, uh, since the beginning of the year, will import configuration profiles natively, and it will just treat them like any other package. And more than that, it treats them really well, treats them proper, and it will add and remove them very nicely and cleanly, so you can rely on it. And Monkey's a very robust way of installing things, so you know that when you say it's going to be installed, it gets installed. And you know when it's going to go out, when, it, when you say remove the profile, it's going to remove it, which can be more than you can set for profile manager. And so if we look at this, it just says install a type profile. Here are all the usual Monkey stuff. We can do a very, very clever thing for this one here, this was the, the Office one, if you remember. This is a way, so this is, an up, this is specific for Office. Well, let's make it an update for Office. Now, that means that when we run Office, and when we run Monkey Next and we've got Office installed, we'll run this profile. It just makes a lot more sense keeping the configuration of an application in with the deployment mechanism. I mean, half of our applications don't use plists and they require post -like scripts, and we're putting that in Monkey anyway. So let's get the other half of them straight in Monkey and manage them all in the same place. I think it's the point that we don't really need an MDM. The main benefit is remote white, remote lock. Well, we're encrypting hard drives and we've got passwords and so on. Good luck. Um, we've got all the other reporting anyway. So we've sort of moved away and we did have a profile manager server and it did fail during an operating system upgrade. And we've never looked back. It was quite liberating to step away from it. Authentication, use AD. Enough said. Um, Apple want you to. Most of your users probably use PCs, or some of you use PC as well. It's what your institutes want you to use. Maybe, if you're feeling brave, use Apple IDs, but we'll see what tomorrow. This, I love to think that the person on Etsy who made this is selling this to uh, Mac system administrators. <laughs> You can buy it for a mere $30, so, you know, for, for your loved one or perhaps a suggestion if you wanted a golden triangle. Again, we, <laughs> we no longer really need a golden triangle. We've got the max bound to AD, or rather, if you like, monkey is our golden triangle, if you like, it's the other part of it. We can move away. We don't have to worry about it. So with that, I think we've pretty much done a whistle-stop tour through all of the different technologies. I'm wondering at this point if you're a bit overwhelmed. There's a lot there. I heard somebody from Casper say this morning, oh, well, you know, the, do you want to spend a buttload of time setting up open source stuff, or should you use Casper to do it? And he's right. I gave a sort of a version of this talk uh, to somebody who's part of St. Vincent's Hospital, um, with St. Vincent's Institute, St. Vincent's Hospital, Garvin, Melbourne, and Sydney, all sort of part of the same um, organization, ultimately. And he said, we've got a new CEO, and we... Uh, we don't have any Macs at all. We manage PCs, and we manage them well. He says we've got to have a Mac, and his PC needs a Mac. So his, his PA needs a Mac. What are we going to do about it? And I ran through all of this. And at the end of it, he just looked at me and said, you're kidding me. I've got to do all of that. Fair enough. I said, don't worry. There's this great product that does most of it anyway. Plus, you can get somebody to come and set it up for you. And he gets sold. So, but the advantage of us is don't do it all at once. You know, it, it may look quite overwhelming if you're starting with nothing. But we didn't start with nothing. We started with ARD, and then we said, well, maybe we'll do it a bit of monkey. Maybe we'll add this component, or maybe we'll add that component. So we didn't just start off. It was quite a sort of a granular process. Um, and if you do it that, it's not quite so overwhelming. What I hope you might be is inspired and say, wow, that's pretty cool. And you might have noticed that when I've credited all of the people who created the technology, Probably about three quarters of them work in higher education, doing jobs like me, or like you. They just had an itch to scratch one day. And I thought, do you know what? I might make something that makes my life better. So Australia's a bit underrepresented in uh, Maxis admin tools. Maybe the next one will come from here. Thank you. Any questions?